After, yeah. Your, yeah, after your COVID cough, shall we um, give everybody a little uh, instruction where, where to put their question and answers? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, if you open up the Q&A box for uh, entering any questions you may have for, for our resident expert tonight, who is Barry, um, obviously use the comments uh, for just any general comments, but if, if you could please put the Q&A, uh, any questions in the Q&A session, it, it makes it easier for us to, uh, to, um, to manage the questions. So we are now live on uh, YouTube as well. So good evening, anybody on YouTube. And over to you, Mark. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, apologies for not being about last week. Um, I saw that uh, Barry and the team did a wonderful job. I was watching it live from my bed in on in, on the YouTube channel, which, um, um, well, take that the way you want it to be anyway. Um, so this evening, um, Barry and I were, and Andy have all been chatting about um, a slightly different format, and Barry's offered to do a session on foam cutting. Um, we'll expand a little bit further on that throughout the session, but, but towards the end of the session as well, we want, just want to open up to the audience a little bit more, get a little bit more feedback from everybody about future sessions. We've got a, about another five or eight sessions lined up um, and a few other slots that are vacant. And, and really what we want to do before the, the session's out is just get some flavours of what you would like to see. Do you want to see a little bit more in depth? Do you want to see something more expert, less expert, more club based? Um, so, you know, waiting for that information towards the end of the end of the session. But for now, Barry, we'll uh, leave you in charge. We'll mute and, and let's see what you've got to do in your workshop. OK, thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, Andy. So this evening, I'm going to talk to you all about cutting foam wings. I'm actually going to cut a wing in, um, on, on the Zoom, uh, which is a bit of a first for us actually doing a live sort of demonstration. My experience of cutting foam wings goes back to 1977. When I was still at school, I was building a uh, 40, pack, 40 size RC aerobatic model and I wanted my own wings for it and that, that's where I started off and I've learned an awful lot about making straight foam wings in, in that time. Now what I'm going to say to you, you, some of you might think that my process is a little bit complicated um, and a little bit involved but I guarantee you that this makes the really straight foam wings. Um, I, I just never get a model that has aileron trim on it when I've made the wings this way. Now, you can cherry pick out of what I'm doing what may suit you, but you'll probably get incrementally um, lower quality and, and variable quality by, by doing that. So in sort of true Blue Peter style, um, this is a, a, a small wing. It's for a um, Cotswold Tracer, which um, I make make wings for now. Now you can see that I run the I run the um, foam right to the trailing edge. I don't truncate the foam like most most kits have. Um, most kits put a false trailing edge on, and then a sort of aileron. Uh, stock onto that i don't like doing that because that's another variable that you're adding in you're having to sort of just shape that um wood into the profile of the wing and you get some possibility for um an error there when you cut right to the trailing edge like this you've got a kind of a a witness mark there is a little bit of trimming that's still required but you've got a witness mark to to, to work to We've got a sheet that we've uh, created that we'll be able to um, email out and put, Andy's probably talking about putting it on the BMFA website with all of the materials. There's quite a few different little bits and pieces of materials. Um, I get the phone on, buy it online from a company called Eccleston Hart. It's very cheap. In fact, the, the carriage is as much as the phone, but you know, it is what it is. At least you, at least you get it. It's, it's pretty good fun. Um, I've seen slightly better over the years, but um, it's, it's quite, quite, quite adequate. So the real 
important thing is to be working off of a flat surface. And what I use is a piece of kitchen worktop. You can see it here. This is actually a granite uh, piece and it's, I uh, didn't pay anything for it. A friend of mine got, got hold of some and he said, can you cut it up? I said, yeah, no problem. So I had half of it and he had half of it. It's pretty close to the quality of a, an engineering surface table. Not quite, but pretty close. And this forms the basis of all of the work that we're going to do um, tonight. It's a flat, flat surface to work from. So one of the first things that we have to do is make the foam sheet uh, nice and flat. It's not, it's not true enough or flat enough how it comes um, from the manufacturers. But I think you can probably see that this is a really nice fit. You know, it's really flat, this piece of foam against that, that work, work surface. This is very important. And it's also very important never to put stress in this piece of foam as you're working on it. So if it has got a bend as it comes from the uh, manufacturer, don't try and take that bend out what you've got to do is skim the block to get it get it flat. So if it had a, a big bend in it that way, as I put it on the um, granite table here, I, I put some weight in the center. So we're not taking that bend out. We're going to take that bend out with the hot wire. This is very important. Don't put that foam block under any, any stress. So what we'll do, I've got a pre-cut pre piece of foam here. So this is exactly how it's come from the um, supplier. And I've just rough cut it over oversized, oversized. So what I've got to do, I'm going to put that there. I use these parallels a lot. You could uh, use something like these aluminium extrusions. Now what this parallel is for, it's a kind of a rail to run the wire on. We'll have a little look at the bow in a, in a minute. So what you can see with the parallel and that little packer that I've got underneath it, this piece of aluminium, you can see that there's just a little bit just a little bit of the foam stuck up. Yeah, you can see it better now. You can see there's just a little bit of the foam stuck up above that parallel. And what's going to happen, I'm going to run the bow on these parallels and it will skim that piece of the that top surface there. Then I'm going to flip it and I'm going to take these little packers out and then I'm going to skim the other side. So that gives us a really true uh, block of foam. Before we actually do that, we'll talk a little bit about the bow. You used to be able to buy wing cutting bows, but that's long ago. I think MFA used to make them. They're pretty easy to make. This, this is a piece of 25 mil Dowel, it could be something like a broom handle. And it's got these one eighth inch piano wire legs in the end. So there's a hole, one eighth inch hole drilled into the, into the bow quite a long way, probably four or five inches, something like that. Same this end. These bits of wire, if I was to release the nichrome wire, these bits of wire go almost out like that. So there's a lot of tension on these um, legs, these one eighth inch piano wire legs, and all that tension's put on by the, by the wire. When I made the um, bow in 1977, when I was a kid, I had something quite a bit more complicated. I had some kind of spring system and a kind of a bell crank to uh, tension the 
uh, wire up. That was nowhere near as good as as good as this is. And it's and as you can see, this is very simple. Just on the end of the um, leg there, there's a little groove that I filed in there so that you can kind of catch this piece of nichrome wire on there. And then there's these two uh, wires are connected to it. And you can see there's a little push button, little push button switch. This wire is 0.35 millimeters in diameter. It's nichrome wire. Um, all of this kind of material is much easier to get hold of now than it was um, some years ago. So I've just seen that my battery's going a little bit flat. So I'm just going to get my power supply. Hang in there for a second. We did say it was a bit unscripted. <laughs> All right, so uh, Alan, Alan, just to let you know, we've we've obviously got some questions from you. We will um we'll cover those once the demonstration uh, is uh, is done and dusted. Um, I won't I won't miss these for you, just to keep you up in the in the picture. Okay, nearly. Hopefully everybody can see Barry on full screen now. I think we've adjusted everything to make sure it, it is the case. I think his video has just gone off. He'll, I'm sure he'll be back in a moment. We've just lost him. We've just lost Barry. Technical issues. All part of the fun. Absolutely. Uh, I Suppose while we're waiting for Barry, if anyone wants to put their hand up and uh, make a suggestion of a future session, feel free. I'll bring you in to talk while we're waiting for Barry. Oh, oh, Graham. Yeah. Graham's straight in there. <laughs> Hi, Graham. You should be able to mute and speak. Hi, Andy. Any chance of um, somebody to do some airbrush demonstrations, please? Ooh. Interesting. Oh. Yep. Yeah, I'll make a note of that. I was actually trying to set something up the scale guys are usually the the ones that are pretty pretty hot on that um and i am talking to uh, a couple of scale guys at the minute so i'll i'll sort of uh, see if they've got any suggestions for airbrushing see what we can do that's a really really good session that would be yeah thank you thank you and then awesome. nigel taylor yeah hi guys i have to admit i haven't seen any other of these but what about something on servo repair? It's an interesting one. Thank you. <clears throat> I've never repaired one. I'll throw them away and put a fresh one, then it'll go wrong. <laughs> I'm assuming we're talking about much larger size servos, though. But uh... <clears throat> Yeah, I don't think we're talking uh, at the six tab an hour. But uh, no, so some of them these days, the digital ones, they're expensive. So, yeah, repairing them makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. You know. From Alexander Webb to everybody, how about basic covering uh, solar film? And I think that would be, that could be a very interesting session. I think if somebody, if one of us or, or somebody could get set up similar to how Barry is, we could actually uh, do a little bit of session on that. That would be, yeah. that would be quite an interesting one. Yeah, Peter Becker's got a suggestion. Are you writing these down, Matt? I am. I am. I we are, are recording, though. <laughs> yeah, but we're going to watch the recording about that. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Peter. The uh, I'm I'm over here in Western Washington State in the United States, near British Columbia, so I'm close oh. to a British holding. Um, mm -hmm. The art of rubber. I'm getting back into it after too many years. A little bit has changed. I'm actually using 1954 documents. Tell me how to, to age motors and uh, get the maximum out of them. And it is an art. I hesitate to doubt that it's an art because I watch people do it. And it's always very uh, closeted. Uh, our expert, the gentleman you had on that went from uh, Wakefield to F1B, so he buys his preconditioned. Uh, and I don't doubt that, but I fly Wakefield and there's no such thing as preconditioned motors for Wakefield. So I'm building a uh, XL58C right now, and that's 
six strands of six or nine, nine, 19 strands of six millimeter. And that's the biggest motor I will have wound and getting it right is important. So the art of rubber would be a great show if you can do one. Peter, that's uh, an easy one for me. And uh, I've got a, a couple of colleagues, one, one, one who's in the room, but somebody else, we can certainly put something together on that. Um, we might lose funny. a lot of the radio flyers in the room, but um, but certainly from from rubber rubber flyers and free flyers. It, it, it will be slightly concerning who else joins us if you find it on Google. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> as long as we don't refer to it as latex. Yeah. Okay. All right, back to Barry then. Barry, okay. you're back in the room. You cannot imagine, folks, how painful and slow that computer was to. Um, uh, to, to boot up again and get get on to um, the Zoom. Anyway, so we were at the stage of skimming this piece of foam. So with no more ado, I'm going to do that skim. So we're cutting now. You can see I haven't got a lot of weight on there. Just um, just enough to hold it. So remember what I said about not knocking it out of shape, bending that foam. We talked about 3D printing being slow. I'm starting to think that this might actually be quite quite slow so we're getting close to coming out of the block there we go okay bow switched off so you can see we've cut this kind of waste piece off now we're going to turn it over and that's the same level so i've got to get these parallels to come down a little bit a bit now Okay. Same again. The um bow's taking one point one amps. 15 volts. I've got a little fusion power supply here, sort of thing that you'd use for indoor indoor flying, uh, indoor charging batteries, not the kind of indoor flying that Mark does. Okay, going nicely. Okay, so as simple as that, we have got a really, really flat piece of foam there now. So the next thing we've got to do is to cut the, the wing to um, a true, true plan form. Now, if you're only making one wing or a couple of wings, you just get some uh, squares and put them put them on the end and sort of chop it and then you do your uh, whatever your rake back on the leading edges, rake forward on the trailing edge. I would say to you though that if you're going to do more than say five wings, maybe if you were making the wings in your club, then it's worth making up a little fixture like this. It's got all of the squares on there in exactly the right place for cutting this wing to the right right plan form. Then you'll also see that there's a little raised section here, which is what the wing actually, that, that foam block actually sits on. And there's some little nails here that hold the block in position. Now, the purpose of this little raised piece is it allows the, as you go, as you cut through the, uh, block your your the foam block. You're not 
hitting the table. You're not hitting the base straight away. So what I'll do is I'll put this block in there. Put it down on those nails. And you should be able to see now that all of these squares are going to um, hold the bow, hold the wire in the right place. Also, you'll see that the, the squares are on the ins inside of the uh, all of the features. The reason for that is if I don't hold the wire up against these squares, I can get another go at it. If I had the squares around the other way, if I don't hold the bow on the square all the time, I've kind of corrupted the shape of the, um, uh, the plan form. So you're, you're going to like this part now. So hold the bow on there. On. Leading edge going now. I prefer to use aluminium for all of these squares, and you'll see also see in a minute when I show you the um, actual airfoil templates, they're aluminium as well. The, the reason being, if you stop the, the wire doesn't affect the aluminium but if you make the squares out of plywood or glass fiber sheet you actually get a little nick in the in the template or the square and that makes the wire catch the next time barry just while you're cutting up um a question from from barry from another barry barry gregory are there any yeah. health and safety issues with the vapor? Um, we probably should have said this at the start that you haven't got your extractor on because of obviously noise in there and obviously it wouldn't come across. But I mean, what would you normally advise? I would normally, if you're working in a closed, um, kind of quite a tight workshop like I am now, I would say that you are, I have the, an extractor like I've got here. I'll just turn it on now. You can hear it's just a little bit too onerous for, for um, continuing the uh, demonstration with. Just well ventilated. Um, I don't really know anyone who's had a problem with the, um, the fumes over the years. There's very little and it's not very high temperature. So that's my, that's my answer to that, Mark. Just, a, just another one, while I've, while I've interrupted you for a second, Peter Farnell, do the metal blocks cool off the wire at all? Um, that is always the, the worry, but it doesn't seem to um, be a problem. Um, you can see how well it cut, and you can also see how well it's cut against the templates. There, is, there must be some local chilling, but it's not, it's not enough to worry about. The, the pluses of using the metal... Um, squares templates and parallels far outweigh that pro possible problem of the chilling um like i said if these were g10 glass fiber glass fiber sheet um if you stop with the wire on there you get a little burn little burnt feature whereas the aluminium doesn't so there you can see really nice um phone block we'll compare it to another one like a tamiya kit like the japanese made it okay as my father said he was a birmingham based tool maker the consistency and the quality of your production is down to your tools jigs and fixtures never a truer word said so let's discuss the actual templates to cut the airfoil with now the, traditionally people would use 
a rib section template and they would hold it on with a couple of pins or nails and some people even held it on with uh, that double sided tape. That's good. It's quick to make, but it's not as good as this two template method. The problem with running with um, a single rib on there is as you hold the bow on the rib, there's some potential to twist the rib very slightly on, on the block. This method that I'm using here, you can see what's going to happen. We're working away from this granite surface table worktop. So it doesn't matter how hard I push on that template, it is only going to where the baseboard is. A little bit more complicated to make, but they're well, they're well worth it. I, I just wouldn't do the old single rib technique anymore. And you can also see that there's um, station marks. Now, if you're doing the wing cutting with two people, um, so one, one on the bow at the tip and one on the bow at the root, you can call out these numbers and it gives you an idea how you're progressing along. Obviously, I can't see those as, as I'm going to be cutting this, but I just know I've cut so many of these wings, I know where I am, um, so it's not a problem. For these kind of wings as well, I always start at the trailing edge. Now, a lot of people will say start at the, at the leading edge. And the, their thinking in that is that the, they get a very true section at the leading edge. I've got to say to you that I, I probably have compromised the section slightly by starting from the trailing edge. But what I get is a very true trailing edge. And that's what affects the trim of the model. The trailing edge affects the trim and maybe the leading edge is um, has slightly more performance effect. I have not been able to, uh, for me, I have not been able to see any advantage in starting at the leading edge. So I always start at the trailing edge. So there's the cut from um, 0.75 millimeter aluminium sheet, very easy to work by hand. Um, could make them out of G10. I have made them out of thin plywood, 1 16th plywood, but again, the plywood's even worse than the G10. If the bow stops, it burns, it burns the plywood, and you've got a little notch there that's not very nice. I always cut from the, I always cut the underside first. And I prefer to actually make up these little um, nail things. It's a bit of piano, a bit of music wire. I make this little turn knurled bush here. And this is what holds the um, template onto the wing. I've actually got three holes. One, two, three. You've got to be very careful with this middle hole because you can see how close that knurled um, bush is, head of the pin. So I don't actually use that middle middle one. You'll be quite okay just with two. Um, I've also got marks on there to line it up. That, num that number 10, 10 mark there, that goes on the leading edge of block. So. Just hold it there like that. Barry, can you just lower your camera again? Yeah. So we can see. Top man. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Mark. So, again, using the granite uh, plate as our reference, you can see now that that's really, really nicely on there. Barry, while you're, while you're doing that, a couple of questions are coming in just about the, would it be better to use a constant current power supply rather than a fixed voltage? Um, 
I've used all kinds of power supplies. I've used um, Variax, car batteries, car battery chargers, all kinds of things. Um, this power supply, it'll be familiar to a lot of people. So thing that fusion sell 200 watt that seems pretty that seems pretty good um you can see it's cutting real really nicely um so i'm not i'm not going to be looking for any other way to do that i mean it could be as simple as a car battery um so we are very close to cutting now so let me just have a little bit of a tiger now that we've got that block really flat, we can start putting um, we can start putting some weight on it now. There's no it doesn't matter how hard I push on this now. I'm not going to deform it because we 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 got it nice and flat. So again, nice metal weight. Move the so this is the first time. That I've cut a wing on the internet. So starting. Want to drum, drum roll? Um, yeah, let's have a drum roll, please, Mark. Yeah. Um. Just funny enough, the that your position and your stance is quite important. You've got to have enough. Uh, you don't want to stand too close to it because you you you're sort of drawing the bow back into yourself. So. You, you've got to give yourself a little bit of space to step back so just feel where the templates are press go constantly looking Little bit of theatrical nerves there was at the tip. I was a bit jumpy at the tip, lagging a little bit at the root. So I put a bit more tension on the root. If I put too much tension on, it'll start sliding along on that granite table, which you don't want. It's not going too bad now. I can. Just starting to ease the pressure up now. Out. Done. Right. Well, so done. now we change over the the templates. Again, line up number ten at the at the leading edge. Okay, here we go, second cut. You notice no drum, drum roll this time? No drum roll. Because you didn't give me that drum roll, Mark, I didn't get the switch right. There we go, you're all right, you're away. We're going. We're going. Warm knife through but I, I think I've got my equity card now and I've got over my nerves. It feels like it's going quite a bit better this time. Pretty well matched there. But obviously I'm having to move the tip very slightly slower than the root. There are all kinds of clever sort of automated systems, but I doubt whether I could get a wing as good as this off of one of those. Ow. Well done. Lovely. Right. 
Okay. So let's see. Off with the white. Off with the rib template. Very good. Pretty happy with that. I think the underside will have a little bit of, yeah, you can just. Can just see you see that line line there that was just as i was getting into the swing of it that will not make a blind bit of difference to the wing this is a perfectly good wing to use perfectly usable i'm more or less guaranteed that that wing is straight yeah alan alan asked a question on that similar to that on a, on a tapered thinnish section which end should I put my helper on, root or thinner tip? I put the helper on the root, and I'll tell you for why. Um, the you, you have to pull harder on the uh, uh, on the root. You've got to move faster. So just get them to sort of uh, do the root, and also get them to call out. So what you would do uh, with these numbers, as they got as their wire got to. Um, position one obviously it's, it's reverse because of the camera but you get to position one they say one and then when they got to two they shout out two three four five and then the uh, other end obviously they're just gauging these spacings are very slightly less on on the tip by the whatever the um difference between the root and the tip is and you've just got to try and match where they are. It's much easier. So you have to be careful on the um, on the tip that you don't race away because it you you can you could race away and get ahead of um, the person on the route. But you can see that with a bit of practice, if we look at that, let me get it in the right light. So you can see these lines down here. That's that's lines from the boat. But you can see there was hardly any um, drag in the wire. The, the, the speed and everything was just nice. And you could see that when the wire came out, it came out nice and um, equally. So that's that's how to get the that's how to get the core. Now. The um, I usually trim. You can see it's wafer thin along the trailing edge. I will trim that off about five eight millimeters back, and the wood, whether it be veneer or balsa wood, will come past where the trailing edge is. And when I'll talk about putting the, the veneer or balsa wood on in a minute. Obviously, you have to decide what you're going to cover the wing with before you make the templates, because the templates have got the allowance of the thickness of the wood factored in there. So these ones are set up for one and a half mil balsa. If I was to go to veneer, I would need another set of templates if I wanted to get the wing exactly the same size. Um, and veneer is normally 0 0.7, 0 0.6, something like that. And the mirror light ply that some people use is, is 0.4. So if we, got, if we were to sort of wind the clock back a long way, everyone was using copy decks to put the veneer onto the wings. I don't like that um, at all. Um, the problem with the copy decks is you kind of have to rock. Let me move the camera again. You have to kind of put the piece of veneer on the on the work table, and you put the copy decks on on the uh, the wing core and the skin. You have to kind of rock it like that to pick up the um, the veneer, get the veneer to contact. All that time, in my opinion, it gives you some possibility to greatly exaggerated twist, get a wash in, wash out in the wing. 
and then you go around and you do the other, other side. Another big disadvantage of the copy decks is it's not so good when you come to do this uh, sharp trailing edge because it's kind of, well, it's just, it's just latex rubber. Um, and it, you don't get those two pieces of wood really firmly bonded together. I use um, epoxy and it's not demanding what kind of epoxy you use. You can use the um, zap finishing resin is good for sticking uh, either balsa or veneer down. Same with the Bob Smith um, uh, finishing resin, or you can use the, uh, the resin from Easy Composites. Very, very good, EL2, that works, that works really nicely. So when when you do when you're actually covering the wings, you you you've cut your veneers and balsa skins out out slightly oversized, um, and then you you paint the resin onto the wood, not onto the foam, with the exception of a bead around the edges along there and there. No, no more on 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 the on the, on the phone. Same on the underside. Also, using the epoxy, you can reinforce this trailing edge. You can put a strip of like forty nine gram, fifty gram glass either side, and you can put a little toe of carbon fiber down there. Some competition classes don't allow that, so you can't do it in those cases. But that makes you have a really nice firm trailing edge. So imagine that you've got your, your skins on there, you've painted your resin on. To give you some idea, a wing this size will take about, um, the, both the sides will take about 40, 45 grams of, of resin to put the um, Balsa or the veneer on. So you, you've got your. Um, Barry, can you lower the camera again just yeah. so as we can see? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Thank you. So you can imagine just that we've got um, the balsa in, in there or the veneer. And you just press it down with weight. It's much, you get a much nicer. Um, I'll show you the weight. It's another piece of granite. Here it is. You just go like that with it. So it's it's really press pressed down nicely. A lot of people use vacuum bags and swear blind by it. You have to be very careful, particularly with this white foam. You cannot pull uh, a strong vacuum on that on that white foam. It will it will crush it. And you also it's a little you can't control that trailing edge quite as nicely. Um, <coughs> with the vacuum bag as you can in, in this pressed situation. I mean, people, are, the glider people are gonna say that I'm a Luddite doing it this way, but I get super straight wings this way and you need more weight on it than that. Ideally, if you can get 70 or 80 kilos over something like that, that that's good. You can use water containers, you know, um, old fuel bottles, filled up with water you know water's conveniently heavy old car batteries that kind of thing or you can do as i do i put a honda generator on there thousand pound honda generator it's a perfect size to go on there but yeah you need you need weight on there and you can stack a couple up i wouldn't recommend to do more than two pairs in the stack um ideally just one pair is 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 nice once that's cured off overnight, take the weight off. Barry, while you, Barry while you, I know you're just mid, mid throw there, but um, Alan Dixon just asked, he uses PVA glue. Why wouldn't you use PVA glue? Is there any good reasons? Well, I'll tell you why I wouldn't much like to use PVA. I, I kind of, I just would worry, be worrying about the water expanding the wood, putting a little bit, bit like as you kind of make your 
bolts of pieces from free flight models, you might use water to reform or shape the, um, the bolster. And I'm paranoid about um, getting water or dampness in, in the wing. I've, I've never used, and it's another reason I didn't like the copy decks. The epoxy really doesn't, doesn't do very much in terms of warping the wood. And it's also got very low shrinkage epoxy route. I'm not sure what the shrinkage of PVA is. Maybe you might know, Mark, but epoxy that we're talking about here is one, one and a half percent shrinkage on yeah. cure. Um, so that's... I've, I haven't used I haven't used PVA in years, but no. the, the other good thing I can imagine with epoxy is it's going to give you a stiffness that you won't get with other flexible glues, which yeah. is, you know, when you said copy decks, I couldn't even believe you mentioned that because, yeah, yeah. you know, that is just it's flexible it's so flexible and you don't yeah. need that in a wing do you you've got the, the foam the, core to do that the the uh, mark of 95 percent of the kind of foam wing uh, rc aircraft that fly in this country have got the wing the, 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 the veneer or the bolster would held on with copy decks and it's just not as good as epoxy and like i said the uh, advantage of the epoxy is you can start introducing the composite materials into the trailing edge or in other places uh, in higher performance models um, and you're using the right kind of um, adhesive technology to work those glass cloth and, and carbon fiber and that kind of thing you don't need carbon fiber you, you can do it just fine with with glass cloth so what happens then is you just take the core out and it's got the um the bolsters all hanging over it's got a nice sharp sanding block and you can block it block it back so you've still got the trailing edge uh material hanging out here you just put it put it back in the um put it back in the uh stock and mark with a knife the tip mark with a knife the root nice straight edge, just knife the trailing edge off. And at that point, you can look down it and you can see, even if you haven't used any glass cloth in there, you can see the witness of where that glass cloth or resin is. If it's just resin, you'll still see a witness. And you know that that's where you've got, if you're gonna do any additional sanding, particularly with the 1 16th bolster, or 1.5 millimeter bolster, you, you kind of get this, you can imagine where the two pieces of wood run parallel to one another. You've got an eighth of an inch there and you can just sand, sand that down and you've got a nice true witness line to work to. You haven't had to um, put a, a, a line on there. So on the traditional kind of RC model uh, wing where you're putting a, a false trailing edge on to the foam block and then putting an ailer on stock on there, You've got to project some line out to the trailing edge and, and put a, a nice straight line to be able to, to sand to. You've got to have a target to work to. If you don't have a target, you've got to be a really, really good uh, with a sanding block to get it through. Yeah, Lex, Lex got a question here, and it, this is just for clarity. I think we know the answer to this, but you, you didn't actually mention it. So do you, do you bond both the upper and lower skins at the same time? I think everybody assumed you did, but yes, yes, yes. Put the upper, the, put the upper and lower skins on at the same time. Again, the, the, the whole thing about making wings like this is all about treating everything either side of the um, the centre of the, the the section equally. And when you come to cover it, if you're using uh, anything other than um, the heat shrink films, if you're using tissue and dope or glass cloth, it's much better to cover the, uh, the top and the bottom of one side and let that dry go off and then do the top bottom of the other side because you've treated both sides equally. If you do, you people do do it and I have done it where you, do, you cover the bottom side first and then you let that go off and then you cover the top side you haven't treated it equally you you you've got it's all about stresses and, and having equal stresses 
in everything um, to, keep, to get a really true, true wing. Last question on the glue from Barry Gregory. Is there a heat activated adhesive that would allow you to use a warm hot iron? Would it, would it make it easier uh, to set up for covering in that? Um, no, I, I, I heat, well, all, I suppose up to a point, all adhesives are heat activated, um, particularly epoxies. You know, if you have the temperature too low, it just, just won't go off. But the kind of epoxies that I mentioned all work pretty well at about 20 centigrade. And the other advantage of those epoxies is it allows the everything to kind of find its natural place. You haven't, with, with the copy decks, you've got something has grabbed, you know, it's a contact adhesive. So with the epoxy and the pressing, it does enable you to, everything can kind of come into, um, let's say equilibrium, nice, nice equilibrium. Yeah. One more question on the covering. Somebody's asked, have you tried laminating film direct in place of veneer? Laminate, what, what film? Laminating film. Laminating film. Direct in place of veneer. Ron, do you want to come back with a bit more information on that? And then we'll get yeah. Barry to... The answer's probably no, but... Um, let's you get see. a lot of people... Once you go to the uh, the harder phones, like the blue phones, you get a lot of people put the glass, heavier glass cloth straight on. The glide, A lot of the gliders were doing that donkeys years ago. Um, and they were using mylar sheets to... Um, to get a kind of uh, a shiny surface. And you get, I would say you get a 95% finish that way. You you, you cannot get the, I mean, I, I like to get real, well, car, high-end car finishes is what I, where I aim at. And you cannot get, you get little tiny voids when you use the Mylar. Um, and it, when if you start painting it, you, um, you you you've got those voids and pinholes to deal with. It's kind of like a it's like a ropey fuselage out of a, a mould which hasn't got any gel coat or paint sprayed into it. It's quite a lot of work to do afterwards. Of course, I mean, it, a lot of people do like that way. It's a ninety you get ninety five percent of the wing quite quickly that way. Well, Ron came back. I've used black foam. And dock laminating film works well. I'm black to... well, laminating pouches, you know, for laminating sheets of A4, that sort of thing. I think oh, that's yeah, what... yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know the thing you mean. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. That's, an, that's an interesting, it's an interesting technique. Um, so they're heating it up to activate the adhesive, I guess. Well, it must be, mustn't they? Because that's how an A4 laminating thing works, isn't it? Yeah, I have to be very careful. Um, something that's happened with, where I'm working with a lot of younger guys on on model projects at the moment. Kind of, I I got to be careful that I'm not stuck in my ways. You know, I know a way to make wings that's very good. It work. It's really really good. And I'm a, probably a little bit dismissive of some of these ideas that the guys are talking about and asking us questions about now. I, it happened to me with the 3D printed fuselage pattern. I said to my friend, I said, that is a really poor idea. It's going to be rubbish. But I went along with him and it actually came out very good. Um, and a couple of times I've said that with these young, younger people with kind of, it's good that they they coming up with ideas um, and sort of getting on and doing it. We have to be very careful as old farts that we're that we're not getting left behind. So I'm I'm interested to hear about these uh, things. I don't I didn't understand. Oh, that was the laminating. That was the guy who said about the laminating film, wasn't it? Heat activated laminating film. I suppose the worry there is with this white foam is you can see that it doesn't take much to melt it. I don't know what what sort of temperature that works. Well, funny you should say that, Barry, because um, John Bailey's come up with a question here. And um, again, I think I know the answer to this, but I'll let you explain. I assume that, that the bolt of sheeting is joined to make the correct wing cord before offering onto the foam. Should yes. this be joined with Sino? Yes, that's exactly how I do it. I am... Um, 
I, I use, usually use uh, four inch, hundred millimeter wide sheets. Um, and you, it depends how good the wood is. Uh, you might have to true the edge up either with a, a knife or a careful use of a sanding block. Get a nice, nice tight joint. Put a piece of cellar tape or something like that to hold it in the butted, to, butted together. Turn it over and just wick the thin, the thin sino in. I would say that probably something like the aliphatic adhesives might might be quite good for that as well. Um, but I don't, I don't use those adhesives at all. I just use everything with epoxy and sino. Um, what? Mike Griffiths asks a really, really good question here. How do you manage with balsa sheets that are no more than four inches wide? Well, you just button, you button them together and yeah. sign, out, sign out them together. Um, and uh, yeah, David Woods, what do you do for the leading edge? So the leading edge is just very traditional. Um, on this, this wing, oh, bear in mind that it's going to be one eighth of an inch thicker, one sixteenth on the top, one sixteenth on the bottom. It's just a piece of quarter inch, uh, quarter inch wood that's glued onto the leading edge and then shaped in like normal. You either, I have seen people run the foam right to the leading edge, but then you can see, particularly with the balsa wood, getting that to go round the leading edge is, is not so easy. Um, so I've always just done it with um the piece of piece of balsa wood glued on and then shaped in um and that's quite easy to shape in because you're looking at quite a gentle gentle radius it's not like trying to shape in the trailing edge i'm guessing with these wings that you you build them true as in no warps in but um uh we got um a question from i'm just looking for for from peter cox no it wasn't it was it was about wash in and wash out. Wash in and wash How would out. you put those in? Do you cut them in or? So you'd, you'd have to go back. I, I kind of picked the templates up, guessing that this was going to be the question. So you, you'd be designing that wash in or wash out at your design stage. So you would effectively have this template inclined somewhat. Um, and, you, you know, you, you'd get the wash, wash in or wash out set at that stage you could modify it if you decided that you wanted to um have wash out later you could take the two templates and fiddle around with this base edge here to um incline it wash out or wash in the point is, though, you, you, I think the, the, what Ben, I found it, Ben was, I think Ben was saying that you, you're obviously doing this not post cutting a, a straight wing. You're actually doing it as the cut. You're cutting it in. Yeah, 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 yeah. You do, you Perfect. do, you would do. Um, that's going to be your almost at your design stage. And I'm not a big fan of, uh, of of washout. Really, I think most of the models that I, all the models I design myself, we just. Don't, they, they don't have wash in or wash out. They're just neutral. Oh, thank you. What about ailerons? Well, the ailerons. So what happens there is in this um, template here, which is what I rough the core out with, you can see there's a kind of a letterbox slot there. And what happens there is... lined up like that and then with a, a nice sharp uh swan mortem new surgical scalpel i cut that letterbox out in the in the foam so that gives you um a, a letterbox slot in the foam and you drop in a piece of wood into there uh, and bond it in at the stage when you're um covering the, the wing that letterbox slot is straddling the aileron hinge line. So when you've got it all cured off, what you do is you put some cuts in to release the aileron at the inboard and outboard end. And then you, because you know where this 
um, letterbox slot is, you cut the aileron out, straddling that, that letterbox slot. And so that gives you a false trailing edge to the wing, a false leading edge to the aileron where you can hinge it, hinge it from. And you can do, I, I actually don't use any of those mylar hinges, not for 30 years or more have I used those. I always bottom hinge with um, tape, like all weather seller tape or something like that. But it Brilliant. works, works really good. That makes that, that I can show good. that. You can just see the edge of the of the tape there. See, yeah, you can just see it there. And you can see the aileron torque rod here. And the reason it's visible is because you need to get that aileron torque rod very close to the hinge line. And because it's bottom hinged now, the aileron torque rod's very biased towards the bottom of the wing. Brilliant. Thank you, Barry. Right, take a, we're going to take a couple more questions. Um, yeah. There was a couple of bits that we'll put on a, an info sheet. Somebody was asking, where do you get your nichrome wire from? Well, I That's think... What, yeah, I've got all of that on an info sheet. Yeah, so we'll yeah. deal with that as a... Um, and again, I think a, a simple diagram of your of your um, your foam cutter would be, yeah. be good for some, because there are a couple of questions on that from early, early doors. Um, uh, just flicking through the ones that what have, other ones have we got there. Um, oh, brown craft paper for covering. That's like a com control on combat trick, that is. Yeah, and another one with glass cloth as covering. Well, that's probably one for another day, isn't it? Which one's that, Mark? From, from Ray, what about using glass cloth as a covering? Yeah, well, that's some people do do that. Yeah, yeah it, 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 it does work. Um, I, I just kind of quite like the wood, though. You know, it, it works works really nicely for me. Yeah. Look, Barry, I think we'll 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 stop we'll stop that part there because we're 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 running over time. It was a, I mean, fantastic. I mean, it's it's flown past. Everybody's really enjoyed it, and uh, it's a bit you, brave, wasn't it? It was it was very very brave, and um, it all worked worked really well, really apart well. Apart the battery going flat, yeah. Well, we. You should have seen Andy and I. Watch it back on YouTube. You'll enjoy it. Yeah, we adapted. <laughs> we adapted, yeah. Um, <laughs> just before we, we lose everybody, um, can we remind everybody what we've got next week, Barry? Can you? Yes. Next week, we have the JMA, um, an introduction to uh, gas turbine flying. Um, then, so that's the 15th. Yeah. I think then on the 26th, Second, we've got um, your your friend um, Luke. Yeah, we've got Luke Goymore. Yeah, yeah, coming back into aero modelling um, on the first. I'm pretty sure on the first of March we've got <laughs> Neil Tidy um, laser laser engines. After the Pete Holman talk, a lot of people were asking about four stroke engines, and that wasn't Peter's speciality. So we've got um, we've got Neil Tidy coming on the first of March. It's, uh, it's and Andy will put it up on the um, yeah. ITAT. Yeah, and we'll all get yeah, I'll out. be updating the website this week with the yeah. schedule of the month. Eighth of March, we've got um, R Rob Mechtmeyer. He's a Dutchman, um, very famous team racing and pylon racing. Uh, pilot and he's going to be talking about performance model engines a bit like Peter but from a slightly different angle he's not as commercial as Peter is um, so that and he's a world leading expert like Peter is in, in model engines very interesting man he's a world leading expert in acoustic engineering and uh, model aircraft engines he's done the acoustics at the Royal Albert Hall for the Queen and in, in his house he's got a framed photo of him talking to the Queen and he said to me Barry that is the highlight of my professional career talking to the, <laughs> um, talking so to we'll take a few more questions if anybody wants to raise their hand again just from the point of view of 
what you might want to see in the future from us. Um, we're trying to line it up. It takes a lot of lining up. And, and the other thing to add is if you've got some ideas and you've got some wonderful speakers you think are going to be really good, get in touch with myself, Barry or Andy, and we'll, we'll see if we can make it happen. Or um, if you want to do a presentation themselves, by all means. We'll, yeah, we'll, anybody oh, in the room? This, this chat, Mike Beach has put his hand up. Yeah, he, he should be able to unmute now and speak. You there, Mike? Still on mute, I think, Andy, but... Okay. There he is. There we go. Hello. Hi, no, Mike. I might to ask the, about the source of foam. I happen to have uh, recycled a... A uh, hot tub cover recently, and once it's dried out, it seemed to me it would be a wonderful material to make wings from. Is that appropriate, or is that just silly? Well, I, it's not silly, Mike. But the what I found over a long time with the foam is there's various different grades of foam. Some of it's recycled, um, and it has contaminants in it, and if you hit one of those pieces with the wire, the wire just stops dead. It, it can't, it's not got enough heat in, in that wire to cut through a piece of workshop debris, for example. So they, that, that foam that I'm using there, you get that it, it comes from a sheet 1200 by 600 by 50, and you get um, six of those sheets for 14 pounds. So you get a lot of a lot of foam um, for not a lot of money. So I'd probably caution against it just mm. because you can get this foam so cheap um, that but I admire your aspiration to recycle the hot tub. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Does that help you, me, Mike? Yes. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. So anybody else? For um, possible subjects and topics that we might bring forward, we had a we had a, a flurry earlier, so um, we've got some to work on. Yeah, if you want to raise hands, I'll bring you in. Yeah. Power scale PSS as a, as a subject. Yeah, yeah. that would be, yeah. Oh, Neil, let Neil in. So we'll let anybody speak. Oh, Go ahead, Neil. Neil. Neil, how are you, Neil? I bet you haven't unmuted. He hasn't, has he? He hasn't, no. Can we unmute him? Uh, I can only ask him to unmute, which I yeah. have done. <laughs> Neil, you've got to click that unmute button, mate. We'll stop the YouTube in a few minutes, then, if he's coming in. <laughs> uh, well, we ought to stop that now, really, haven't we? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thanks, everybody on YouTube, for joining us tonight. And we'll yeah. see you